to welcome my dear friend and sister, retired Lady Justice Joyce Aloach. We first met Justice in the chambers of the Chief Justice of Kenya in 2006. And I wanted to know who is that amazing, smart, gorgeous, well-dressed, warm woman judge. And it was you. And I've never forgotten our meeting. And I welcome you to the Institute for African Women in Law, our legacy project. Welcome, Justice Alot. Thank you very much, Judge Williams, my sister. I'm impressed that you remember that first meeting. It's so many years ago, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so many years ago. And that was when our bond began. Yeah. And I cannot share with you everything about the justices' amazing career. We would take up all of our time, but I would like to share with you some highlights of her extraordinary career. She was elected to the International Court, the International Criminal Court, the Trial Division, and served there for nine years. The last four years, she was the vice president of that court, and she was the first Kenyan, if I'm recalling correctly, to serve on that court. Before that, she was the first woman to serve on the Court of Appeals in Kenya. I remember that well when you were- Correction, I was the second. The second, the second yeah. woman to serve on Judge the- Judge right. was the first woman. The, I was the second woman to- You were the second me. woman. Yes. But it had been many years since a woman had been appointed to the Court of Appeals. Yeah, it, that's true. Yeah. You served for nine years on the High Court of Kenya, and you were the founder of the family court, as I recall. Yes. And that, you served for many years as a magistrate. And as a result of all of your judicial accomplishments in the Kenyan judiciary, every role really except the Supreme Court, you also played a pivotal role in the negotiations between the African Union and the government of South Sudan. And for those reasons, you became a perfect fit for the ICC. The justice earned her law degree from the University of Nairobi, a diploma in legal studies from the Kenya School of Law, and in 2008 received a master's degree in international relations from Tufts University, the Fletcher School of Diplomacy. She served as chair on many judicial committees, many judicial conferences, and worked to implement a very important law in Kenya, the 2006 Sexual Offenses Act. And I want to begin, Lady Justice, with that last position you had at the ICC. And could you share with us, I know that the point of that court was to deal with war crimes, crimes against humanity. It's an international court that sits at The Hague. Why did you decide to try to get on that court. Why was that important? Thank you, my sister, Judge Williams. First and foremost, one's country has to nominate one. Kenya nominated me to, to run for elections to that court. I remember when nominations to the ICC were open, I was at the Fletcher. I was just um, finalizing my thesis to be able to present it. And so I wasn't able, and at the same time, I was the representative for Africa in the International Association of Women Judges. So I got communication from DC where you are, I trust, or where? Um, yeah. Chicago. <laughs> yeah. You are in Chicago. I'm in Kenya, Nairobi. Wow, how amazing. Wow. So I got information from, because the headquarters of International Association of Women Judges is in DC, Washington. DC. So I got communication from them that, listen, you are their representative for Africa. ICC has opened up for nomination for, for judges. We, as an international association of women judges, we would want as many women judges as possible to approach their governments to nominate them. So I said, okay, okay. I was in the midst of um, trying. The, in fact, I was going to defend my thesis the following day. So that night I worked late. I sent this information to as many uh, national associations which were affiliated to the international body. I think I sent this information to all of them, Kenya included. 
And then I said, you know what, it's uh, going to 2 a.m. and I've got, I'm appearing before the panel tomorrow, I've got to sleep. So that exercise was in August. It, um, no, I think it was, um, yeah, it was either end of um, July or beginning of August. And then that's, that's what I did. I wasn't ready myself. I didn't know much. I, did, I couldn't do anything else. I was focused on what I was doing at the Fletcher. And we were in the campus. When the time was over, uh, when we completed the term, because it was, um, I think we were there for two weeks. Two weeks at the beginning, two weeks in the middle, and two weeks at the end. So I went back home via New York. I needed to rest my eyes. so I could hardly see. So I I took about four or five days and I rested in New York. Then I went back, I came back home. It was already court vacation. And then I tried to find out, I found that, to find out what was going on about this nomination. I talked to the women judges. They said they didn't know what was going on. When the court resumed, I discovered that a name of uh, one of my colleagues who was a male judge had been forwarded to the Foreign Affairs Ministry. So basically, uh, Kenya had made a, a decision. And the name of the judge, uh, God rest his soul, because he's now deceased. The name of the judge then was uh, forwarded to New York and forwarded uh, to The Hague, the seat of the court. And if you looked at the, IC, the website of the ICC, the names of all the nominees were in the website, including that, that particular one. But then as, and then the nominations closed. So come October, for some, for some reason, the, the nominations were opened for a week. And I queried, I said, uh, what, what could have happened? The answer I was given was that Asia Pacific was slow in their nominations. So they had not met the quota. And when it, was, when it is open for one, it's open for all, not just for Asia Pacific. And believe it or not, it was in that, it was that event, that opening, for one week in October that enabled Kenya to change the nominees. That's when I came in. And this, um, it's, it's amazing. It was just some, some miracle because I remember one morning I was just telephoned uh, when I was, I was robbed already. I was, I was in the court of appeal. I was robbed and I was going to court with my two colleagues. And uh, my PA came in with this very urgent message. She was sitting on, in the room next door to mine. And she said, Judge, there's an urgent, urgent call from the foreign affairs. I said, but Jackie, you can see I'm already robbed and my two colleagues are here. With three of us, we are going to court because we were in the court of appeal, three of us. And she said, Judge, I beg you, just talk, just talk. I said, my colleagues, very real gentlemen, they said, listen, it looks, whatever it is, appears to be urgent. We will stand on the corridor. I said, no, you can't do that. I said, we are going to stand on the corridor. Just make it snappy. So I talked to, placed a call to the foreign affairs and I talked to the lady. She was also called Jackie. At that time, she was the head of international jobs. I didn't even know there was anything like that in the, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, that there was a desk for international judge, uh, uh, jobs. I was discovering that, that mon moment. So Jackie told me, yes, judge, we are trying to reach you. Uh, we, want, uh, we want you to put in application. We want you as a candidate. I said, candidate for? He said, for international ICC. I said, but when I was away. He said, yes, we knew you were away and you passed by, via New York. We, we, we tracked you down. We passed via New York, which is true. I did communicate with the office in New York, our embassy. So I said, and as far as I'm concerned, if you look at the website, Kenya has a candidate. He said, Judge, we know all those things. But the team in New York has told us that they are not doing well with the candidate they have. And they have there's one week opening and they have asked us to consider, if possible, if we can change the candidates. That is the process that brought me into, into becoming a candidate because eventually within that week, my name then went to New York. I think they sent two names. They told me they sent two names because they went back to the names. Originally there were 11 names that were interested. One name was taken forwarded because it was supported by the chief justice. He was a judge and 11, uh, 10 names, 10 people remained. So they sat again, the ministry sat again and found that the most interesting thing is that all the 11 names were names of male, either male lawyers or male judges. It was the first time that a woman 
judge was added to that list. And I, I was so grateful that uh, I was picked together with another male uh, lawyer. The names were sent and New York made the final decision when they, they settled for me. So my sister, that is the exercise that ended in me being a candidate for elections to the International Criminal Court. It was just God's luck. I think. Right, that's what I was gonna say, it was God's hand. Being the first, what do you think was the most challenging thing that you faced at the ICC? What was your greatest challenge being the first woman? Um, first, I did find a lot of Africa. There were, the, the, that year when I was elected and I arrived at the court, there were more women than more women judges than male judges. That was a plus. What I found really, I don't know whether it was challenging or interesting. What was challenging was inside the courtroom. I'll tell you what it was. But on arrival, uh, you know, in the court, not inside the courtroom, I was amazed uh, at the fact that I was I was going to deal with a statute which was both common law and civil law. It's a fused system. The Rome Statute is a fused system. Common law, civil law, joined, joined, fused. So that was a bit of a challenge because I'm a, a common law. Uh, I have a very strong common law background. So this was the first time that I was um, going to handle issues under this kind of system. That was uh, that was something that interest what that I found new. Now, inside the courtroom, the very first day I was inside the courtroom in a session, I was surprised. The setup, the set, the setup uh, was interesting. I was used to prosecution defense. Here I, here I was now, prosecution next to the prosecution counsel for victims and, the, and on the other side, defense. That was something interesting, something very, very new. And once in a while, occasionally, the registry also in one corner. So that was something really new to me. Yeah. And you, you had to obviously be in The Hague and leave your family. How did you, what gave you the strength and the courage to take on this new assignment? First of all, when the, when the, Ministry of Foreign Affairs decided on me you now that I would replace the original candidate. I remember I came home and I told my husband, I have something I would like us to talk about. He was surprised. I said, I, I told him everything that had been going. I had not talked to him all that time until that evening. So he said, you know what? Go for it. Just go for it. It's your, it's your turn. It's your luck. If your name is going to be forwarded, you have my consent, go for it. That gave me the motivation. And then something else that gave me the motivation was the fact that my children, my three daughters, I have three daughters, they were, they, they were grown up. The firstborn had already completed her studies, Warwick University, Queen Mary College in, 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 in London, she was back. My second born, Sandra, had already completed her term, her studies, Yes, in the States. She studied mostly in the States and finally ended, finished her studies at um, uh, New York University. Yes, her master's. Connie, who is the fashion stylist, still was doing, uh, undergoing her uh, training. Uh, her master, she was doing a master's degree in Milan in fashion. So the fact that none of them were young gave me the motivation also because they were at, a, at an, a stage where I could, I could be away from, from, the, from home. Yeah, that also gave me the motivation, yeah. And then let me ask you this, because you've served in so many roles on the judiciary. As a little girl and as a young woman, did you always want to be a lawyer or a judge? I never even thought about it. Law was never my choice of a career. Law was my father's choice of a career for me. I didn't have any role model who are lawyers, so I didn't really have any anybody to you know to to learn or to, to to get issues about law from. So it was never my choice of a career. No, I fulfilled my father's choice of a career. That was law. That was law. And were there any lessons? 
that your parents taught you that helped you along the way? Because we're going to talk about other challenges you faced. Any lessons or advice that they gave you that helped you along the way? Let me put it this way. My father was in the in the government, in the provincial administration before independence. There were just four of them. In fact, I have a photograph of them out, out on the wall. There were just four of them in Kenya who were district commissioners before independence. And as district commission in that position, they used to, they were trained and they used to serve as magistrates as well. Apart from for administration, they also served as um, magistrates. So I remember my father used to tell me that, listen, when I look around um, at the family and I was child number seven, my mother had seven children, 10 children, I was child number seven. So my father used to tell me, I think you number seven, I think you can do this work, this work that I'm doing. But that was so many years ago, I didn't know that eventually he would, uh, he would just tell me, you know, steer me towards law but he used to make statements like that once in a while that what i do we i sit as a magistrate which is true they used to sit as magistrates and you tell me i uh, looking at you number seven i think you can do that work so <laughs> <laughs> so so his confidence in you number seven lady yeah. this number seven meant the world to you and helped inspire you you, you currently focus now on mediation. Uh, yeah. You're a leader in court annex mediation in Kenya. You work in me the mediation area with FIDA, which is the women's rights organization in Kenya. And you do private mediations. Yeah. Why do you think mediation is so important to Kenya and really in general? Why is it changing justice in Kenya? What I can say about mediation is a conversation. I facilitate disputants' conversations. I gear them towards uh, issues, interests, concerns, as opposed to um, adversarial. It's also affordable for many people in Africa, in Kenya, in Africa. And by the way, there has always, mediation has always been ongoing at community level. It's just that today, or it's formalized, but communities in Africa, and in, in Africa and India, particularly, maybe Pakistan, there has always been some sort of mediation going on. Even now in uh, some communities in Kenya, they still have their own way of mediation. But uh, now we are talking more of a formalized system of mediation that um, emanates right from the constitution of Kenya. Article 159C of, of our current constitution. And you know, you remind me of that tradition across the continent at the museum and the Supreme Court in Kenya is a big tree. Yeah. The museum, which reminds everyone that mediation and resolving disputes was from almost the beginning of time in Kenya. And when you look at the backlog in the courts, and the number of people who can't afford lawyers because the majority of people coming into the Kenyan courts are without representation. This court annex mediation program and formalizing it and putting more emphasis is really important, isn't it, Lady Justice? Very, it's very important because um, in mediation, you don't necessarily, you don't really need to come with a lawyer, but if you have a lawyer, is where he or she is most welcome, but you don't have to. And this is one thing we try to preach to, uh, to people that please come as you are. You don't have to have a lawyer because we will explain the process to you. And the final decision always comes from the disputants. They finally, hopefully agree to a, a resolution that they can live with, with the, with the facilitation of a mediator. Yep. And, and I want to talk some about your Court of Appeals experience, because I can recall, I met, I also saw you later that summer at the judges colloquium, where mm -hmm. High Court and Court of Appeal judges gathered, and I had the honor and privilege of attending for seven years in a row. 
<laughs> yes. First, I was the first non-Kenyan to attend that. And uh, that's how I ultimately got my name, Atiano. Atiano, which means Atiano, you were born, born at night. Born at night. Yeah. And um, I know there was a real push by the Women Judges Association, because at the time I started coming to the meetings around 06, at that point, there was not a woman on the Court of Appeal. And the Women Judges Association and FIDA was very supportive of that. And can you talk about the importance of women's organizations in helping other women? Actually, thank you. By 2006, I think we had one woman judge in the, we had Judge O'War. I had not yet uh, um, been elevated to the Court of Appeal, but Judge O'War was there. But I know that the women's organization, FIDA, and the others did were pushing for women because they said we have qualified women. Why is it that we don't have them in the Court of Appeal when they are qualified? And um, uh, the importance of women generally in the, in, in the judiciary, Court of Appeal, High Court, is we have a certain amount of sensitivity as, as women. And we look at things from a different perspective. Maybe that's, that's what I can say, yeah. And you brought your life experience to the position and the family court then became very critical. That was when you were on the high court. Why was it important to start that court? Two reasons. At least these are the reasons that I remember giving the chief justice of the day, uh, why it was important. At that time, when I established the family division, we had the civil division and criminal division were always there. Then I think the, the business community pushed and eventually the commercial division was established. Now, I then started watching and uh, one thing that I really was never made me uh, comfortable at all was the fact that most of the family matters for reasons that I do not know were listed in the afternoon on the course list. And yet the, the, the bonds, papers, and relevant documents say that they must, you have to be in court by, I think it was nine. So what and it ended up being that husbands, wives, or families in succession, they would be on the court corridors the whole morning, mm. the whole afternoon, until about 2, 2.30 or 3. And I just thought we couldn't have, we couldn't get, we could couldn't continue to have anything like this. It was, according to me, it was, I, I just couldn't take it. So that was one reason. I, I made an observation for a long time. I even tried to find out that, why is it that family matters are listed in the course list in the afternoon? One reason I was given was there are so many people involved in these family matters. And if we list them in the morning hours, maybe it takes too much time, whatever. But anyway, I wasn't convinced. That was one reason. And second reason was, it was just at the onset of HIV and AIDS pandemic at the time. Did I know we would be talking about an, a COVID pandemic? At that time, it was HIV and AIDS. And deaths, especially of parents, deaths were occur husband and wife, deaths were occurring so close to, you know, husband, wife, mother, father, they were dying so close to each other that children were suddenly left orphans. So um, the issues of how was school fees going to be paid, the issue of a legal document to access money from the accounts of parents became so, so crucial. I remember um, uh, so, many, uh, so many people, started, women started asking me that, I'm told that I need a legal document. What sort of document is it? So that was the, that in fact, it, it became so timely because what I did in the family division registry as so many people are going, so many um, maybe widows, widowers, those who are not able to afford lawyers who are going to the registry to say, can, we, can you give us this legal document? Then they would find that, oh, you have to file a case, you have to go before a judge, you have, so in Kenya, under the Succession Act, litigation under Succession Act is mostly by statutory forms. If you open the back of the Succession Act, 
you will find if you want to apply for a grant, a grant of probate with a will, an ex, all those are forms which you just fill. So what happened? What happened? So what happened at that time? What is still happening mostly? You go to a lawyer because you want to apply for a grant of probate. And these are the documents the lawyers would fill, complete, and then you sign. So I said, listen, I walked and I went to the government printer where the government documents are printed. And I took several forms and I said, please, can you print these forms? Uh, these are government forms from this act. Can you print them? If you are not, you don't have transport, I will send somebody to collect them and we put them in the family division registry at a very, very nominal uh, fee. I did put a very nominal fee. I had discussed this with the chief justice. Mm -hmm. And then I got law students who would be, I explained to them what the mission, what I was, what I was, what I wanted from them to be able to explain, just to explain how to fill the forms to people who are not able to afford and then sign. Because once you fill the form, that is what you give to the registry. And that is how you file a case when you are dealing with succession. So I thought that this, this was the, the easiest way that I could help out. I just didn't know that I was stepping on the, on the toes of the lawyers because then they, they, a delegation went to the chief justice that I was doing this and I was taking away their work. It never occurred to me that this would be a complaint, but it worked. Many, many uh, people were able to file cases without lawyers so that they could be channeled to the family division judges and, um, and then get the relevant documents, whether they were uncles, aunties, so that school fees could be paid. It was, an, it was a real issue, HIV and AIDS at, at the at pandemic at the beginning. The pa parents, um, and very unfortunately, parents were dying too close to each other and the children were left orphans, many, many children. Yeah. And, and so, Again, that's why I admire you so much, because you have the ability and the foresight to see a problem, to see an injustice, and not just see it and talk about it, but to do something about it. And that, to me, is one of the roles that judges can play. I mean, judges don't just listen to cases and decide cases. Judges are presented with all of the challenges that face a society. And there are ways that we can be active and ways that we can help. That innovation of yours was so, so important, so important. And in terms of innovation on a, on a smaller scale, you'll recall that when I started coming to the colloquium, I, I was always presenting with PowerPoint. Yeah. Before that, before that, most of the speakers would have a paper which yep. could read and they would pass it out at the end. Yeah. And I remember so well, after about the third colloquium I had attended, yep. that you presented by PowerPoint. Yes, I did. And yes, I remember I you saying your husband used it all the time as a doctor. Yes. It was going to go, but you did it. And do you think when you were done, everyone in the room applauded? Yes. <laughs> I said that if I said if my sister Judge Ann Williams can do it and does it, I can do it. So I had to do it. Yes. And I, I just to me, we learn from each other. Yes, and we do. Yeah. And the yeah. other thing that I also want to share with this group is, you know, how I was always doing training of magistrate judges and prosecutors yes. and PETA and not-for-profit mm -hmm. teaching trial advocacy. And I remember I asked you if you would be willing, I think you were on the high court at the time, to yeah. come speak with the magistrate judges. Mm -hmm. And we had to get the permission from the chief justice. Yeah, we have to. Yeah. Said it was the first time a high court judge had come to formally share with them what high court judges expected from magistrates. Yeah. You're the person that says yes. Why do you say yes to challenges? Because um, if you can't face challenges, 
then 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 it's not interesting and if you if you if you take a challenge if you face a challenge and you manage it then you know you can go the next step i like to i like to be challenged so yeah. what advice what advice do you have for our women lawyers that are listening who might one day want to be a judge like you what are some of the tips you want to share with them on how to be successful you have to be focused i believe i was fairly focused hard working focused credibility is key and uh, just being aware of your surrounding what goes on in your surrounding don't be in your own cocoon challenge yourself i like the the theme for this year's international uh, uh, women's day choose to challenge i can see that i did choose to challenge many years back but um that that's that's how i am and many hands helped you you know because at the time you were going through the judiciary there weren't that many women the new constitution passed and you can correct me if i'm wrong but i think it mandated that a third of parliament and a third of the judiciary were yeah. to be women and yeah. Actually, right now in Kenya, there's a search for the chief justice. Interviews are going on, and there are three women candidates. There have yes. been there have been three there have been women vice presidents of the not vice presidents, uh, deputy chief justices. Uh, yes. And so, what do you think the chances are that Kenya will finally get a woman chief justice? it really depends on uh, the panel that the judicial service commission because uh, they must know what they are looking for but i think we have competent women who can be chief justice that i that i i, 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 I that is true we have competent women and it's and it's my it's my greatest joy today having been the second woman judge magistrate judge and the two of us have been high court judges with two women for almost 10 years is my greatest joy my greatest pride to see so many women now vying for these positions and to know that even right now the deputy chief justice who is acting is a woman 20 years ago would i have ever imagined what i'm seeing today yeah and you had hands that helped you because of course when you came through the system it was primarily male yes so for mentors that helped you. And I know you have a philosophy or a belief that when hands have been reached out to you and helped you, you mm -hmm. need to help others. Could you share with us some of the things you do to help other women and really other people who maybe weren't fortunate like you, who had fathers that were lawyers, people who are first generation college, first generation law, uh, law students, first generation lawyers. I know you spend time helping others. Could you share with us some of the things that you do to help others? Uh, in this line of, of, of law, law and I mean, justice, law, ADR. First of all, I have a lot of young women whom I mentor. I have a whole string of them whom I mentor. One thing I always tell them that whatever you do, you have to do better than what I did. What I did was in the past. What you're doing is moving forward. So you have to do better than what I have done. And I tell them about being fearless, being confident, being focused. Uh, integrity is key. I give, I tell them all this as I mentor them. And I tell them, you know, you, you have, you, you are smart. And don't let anybody put you off. You, you, you are very smart. And don't be shy because women, we are known to be shy at some point. Mm -hmm. I, I tell them that uh, when we were only two women judges, we did many things on that high court bench as we were. And one of them was amazing because uh, it, opened, it opened a way out, not just for women judges, but for the women in the, in, in the civil service in Kenya. Because we discovered Purely by a chance, uh, I was sitting with a male judge and we finished, we had a session. I think we were reviewing a judgment that we were about, we were to deliver in two days time. And then uh, those were the days, good old days when they would take pay slips to different judges offices. And we happened to have been in my chambers. 
and he was given his pay, mine was my pay slip was given to me and he said hey i'm here if you have mine so both of us had, had our pay slips in our hands he read his i opened i read mine and I, then i said uh, my brother let's see let me see there is mine let me see yours so when he gave me his i said listen why why are you being paid the, you are and me are in the high court we are both judges why are you getting this allowance it's not in my pay slip he told me, no, my sister, you can't get it. I said, why? Because you are a woman. I said, excuse me. He said, no, because you are a, you are a married woman. So you can't get this, uh, this, this, this allowance cannot be given to you because you are a married woman. I said, just hold on. Do you mind? Can I just, can you just give me your pay slip for only one minute? He said, Don't have it. You can send it to me later. It, it was a love, very nice uh, male mm -hmm. guy, very good friend of mine. The minute we parted, I went straight to my sister judge because we were only two women in the, and we were both married. I told her, my sister, have you got your pay slip? Can I look at it, Judge Owo? She showed it to me. I said, listen, you and I, we don't have this, 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 this. It is in my brother's pay slip. So he said, okay, wait, wait a minute. And it's true, we didn't have that allowance. So I told her, listen, my brother just explained to me, and you can cross-check with the, with, the, with the registry, you and I cannot be given this allowance because we are married women. So I said, we sat there and we, we formed a strategy. We said, listen, we will go down to the office of Directorate of Personnel Management. We are going to go in two days' time, and we are going to find out why. Because we are not just married women, we are judges. Mm -hmm. We are going on the basis that we are judges. We are married, yes, but we are judges. So what's the difference between me and my brother judge? What's the difference? So as we were going, it, it, it was such a big issue that between the two of us. In fact, my sister was even, <laughs> was even more upset than me because when we were going, I told her, listen, I'm carrying only one document. I'm carrying the course list, the daily course list. That daily course list lists the name of a judge and then uh, what you what is what is coming before you it doesn't say j a large female it doesn't say ah. it's so and so male yeah and that told her that is the document the only course list is the only document i'm carrying she said i'm not carrying anything i've got everything in my head i'm not carrying anything <laughs> so when we went to that office quite dramatic i will maybe leave the drama part of it out <laughs> because <when> we, <laughs> no no keep the drama in we want to hear it <laughs> because when we arrived at that office office of director of personnel management we opened the door and the sec the, the pa asked us do you have appointment i was trying to explain my sister judge went and opened the door of the boss and you know he got up because he said oh judge i wasn't expecting you he said, not expecting me. I'm not just here alone. I'm here with my sister judge. He said, please come in. He came out and told the, his PA, these are judges, let them come in. So I, my first statement to him was, I'm so glad you recognize we are judges. What has brought us here? <laughs> yes, because that's what he called us. Yeah. He said, judges, come in. So I said, what has brought us here is we are being discriminated against. We are only two women judges. We cannot be paid house allowance. All our male colleagues are being paid. And the discrimination against us is that we are married. And I'm glad when you call us judges, because we are judges. Why should we be treated differently from our male colleagues? So he said, oh, judges, um, this is the government regulation uh, that married women should not be, are not paid house allowance. So my sister said, my sister judge said, I want to see that uh, regulation now. So he picked the phone, he called one of his officers to bring that regulation. So we argued our way. We said, uh, I, then I now produce the cost list. I said, uh, I still remember his name. I said, Mr. Kandie, if you look at this cost list, it says so-and-so, J, J meaning judge. If you're in the high court, it's judge. If you're in the court of, that time we were in the high court. If you're in the high court, it's J-A, judge of appeal. I said, nowhere does it say in bracket or otherwise female. It just says J judge. So why are we being discriminated against? We are judges. 
So we had a long conversation and then uh, he said, okay, I understand what you're saying. I think you have a point. We, we have never thought about it in this respect. I just know that uh, women in the civil service who are married, living with their husbands to, are not paid house allowance. So he said, uh, can you now put this in writing? He said, we are going to come. If we put it in writing, we are coming back today. He said, no, 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 judges. Can you put it in writing? And <laughs> I will send a very, <laughs> a very, very reliable officer, the one who brought me the regulations, and then he will bring he, he will bring that your documents, and then we'll have to have a we'll have to consider because this point has never been raised, it has never come up. So this was that we did this, and then after two days, and um, a response came that my sister judge, because most of the time her husband was living away from uh, Nairobi and in, in Kisumu County and would be, back, would be coming maybe from Friday. She said, because your husband is, you're not living with your husband all, all the days, Monday to Friday, January, you'd be paid. But judge, you are, you are here with your husband, he's here, he's a doctor. That was the, so my sister said, listen, we are going back. I said, just hold on. <laughs> Let's write a response first. So we argued that until we were both, we both got letters to say, yes, you will now be paid house allowance. But because we were married women in the civil service, this eventually permeated, permeated throughout the civil service. So married women working in the civil service started being paid house allowance. You are quite a revolutionary. That was amazing just amazing and again it was god's hand that yeah. your brother happened to get you know that the checks got mixed up yeah and you but it just to me you were talking about your advice to young women fearless focused yep seeing a wrong and being strategic on how you handle it and how you handle it so it wasn't a situation where you just went in ranting and raving. No. You plan. Yeah. We, we, we had a plan. And isn't I, having a plan so important? I told my sister, let's sit down and plan. How are we dealing with this? Because I, she was so heated up. She said, no, we are going to go to the president. I said, no, we will not go to the president because he will send us back and say, you, you, did you go to this office first? So what are we going to say? So I said, we start in that office first. If they are, they are not listening to us and not doing anything about it, now we can go to the mm -hmm. place we go to. So you, we had to be very strategic. And so the, as women face barriers and challenges, you can get angry and you can get yes. mad, but you have to get over that, right? And yeah, you have to. Play. And we were actually very angry. Uh, we, were, we were very, very angry. And then now I had to play the, I wasn't a mediator then, but then I had to, <laughs> I had to calm my sister down and say, listen, let's handle it carefully. Because if we do it carefully, we are bound to get somewhere. Let's be careful how we are handling it. Yeah. And that, that's, we were very strategic. And at the end of the day, it was sorted out. Yeah. We're coming to the end of our time, but you did mention your husband, the doctor. So could you share also with us how you were able to balance? And you mentioned you had three daughters, your legal career and a family. Any tips or suggestions you have for women that are trying to do the same thing? Yes, it's, uh, it's, it's, it can be very tricky to balance. But as uh, married women, we need the support of our husbands. So we, mean, we need their understanding. I happen to have been married very early. I, I wedded, my wedding was um, when I was first year law student. So by September 11th this year, my husband and I will have been married for 50 years, five zero years. Congratulations. Thank you. We pray that we make it, yes. So um, it over the years, his support has been very important to me. I have openly discussed the direction I'm going, what I feel I want to do, and he has always supported me. He's been very, but he's a very successful medical uh, man in his own field. He's a um, physician, chest speciality, 
is very well qualified frcs in uh, from edinburgh he's very well qualified so he understands the value of of education i just feel uh, sometimes i feel very sorry for somebody who is uh, a woman who is uh, progressive who is qualified and if you don't get the support then it becomes very difficult because mm -hmm. uh, it's, it tends to disorientate a lot of women. Yeah. And good words of advice. So I guess I would say behind every great woman, <laughs> great man. Uh, and it does Support. matter who you choose as your, it does matter who you choose as your spouse, especially as you're trying to raise children and advance yeah. your career. You have said that you tell young women you want them to be, to do better than you. I, I find it hard to yes. see who could do better than you have, Lady Justice Aloach. But I, I want to also end on this question. Yeah. Who do you want your legacy to be? How do you want to be remembered? I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to speed up anything here, but I'm trying to. You know, your legacy, what do you want it to be? It could be to women, to, to the judiciary, to the nation, to the international community. What is your legacy or what will it be? Uh, for me, um, the areas where I have worked, where I have served, be it serving the children, which I did elaborately at the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. I established the African Union uh, Committee for the Children be it in the judiciary, be it now as a mediator, I think integrity is key. Because if you have integrity in everything you do, you never have to look back because you have nothing to worry about, isn't it? You move forward, you assist people, you don't cut corners and you feel free, really. Well, we all wanna feel free like you, Lady Justice Aloch. You are an extraordinary woman, extraordinary leader, extraordinary jurist and mediator. And it's been my honor and pleasure to have this conversation with you today. Thank you so, so much for your honesty and your candor and for being who you are. Thank you. Thank you, my sister, Judge Ann Williams. I know that uh, I look forward to receiving you when you come home to Kenya because this is your home. And we've been used to having you. It's just that COVID will not allow us to have you anymore for now. But I believe in the future, we'll continue to have you. And please let us continue to, um, to have, to bond up, to bond, to have conversations, to talk, to discuss. There's so much to talk about. Yes, there is. And there is still a lot of work to do. So much work to be done. Yes. Because as you said, I, am, I choose Kenya. Kenya is my heart. Thank you. Yes, and that's why we, that's why we gave you a Kenyan name, Atieno. Right. Right. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank Love you. Me. Thank you. Love you too, dear. Okay.